Okay, thank you again and uh, very good evening. So what we want to see today is uh, how to have a daily devotional because we want to build up on prayer. It was pointless for me to start uh, teaching on intercession if I don't lay the foundation of uh, every uh, day's uh, prayer routine. Uh, so having a daily uh, devotion. I did not say a weekly devotional. I did not say a monthly devotional. It is a daily devotional that we are supposed to be having with our Heavenly Father. So that's what we want to see today, how to have uh, a daily devotional. So God wants to talk to us. So for, for point number one, God wants to talk to you daily, not once in a while. God truly wants to talk to you daily. He wants to have uh, not a uh, um, monologue, but a dialogue. Many times when a Christian come, uh, Christians, they come in the presence of the Lord is to have a monologue. So they would... Uh, say what they want God to, to hear. They'll give the list of requests and God doesn't even have one minute to say a word back to them. So that's a monologue, that's not a, a dialogue. So God wants to converse with us. God wants to talk to us on a daily basis. So that's what truly we want to build. So the Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 4, Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 4. So have a paper. When you also come in the place of prayer or in the Bible study, have your Bible. When you go to talk to God, have your Bible, have a, a piece of a, a notebook or a pad, uh, whatever, iPad, uh, if your phone, if your, your Bible is in your phone, these days my Bible is in my phone, so, and I can uh, make some comments, uh, uh, every scripture, so uh, most of the time I just do it on my phone, because all my Bibles are written uh, on it, um, I've written on, on them everywhere, so I no longer have place to write on my Bible, so uh, sometimes I write an email to myself, and I email myself what the Lord has talk, uh, said to me that morning, and I put it inside the folder where, the, uh, where I have all the revelation that the Lord has given to me personally. So you need to have a pen in your devotion when you come in the morning. You need to have your Bible. You need to have a, um, a notebook, something, not a, a, a single piece of paper, because you can easily lose it because and you need to write a date on today uh the 20 the second of Feb february at uh, such a, such an hour this is what the lord said to me when i was uh, doing my devotional so that you can go back to what the lord said to you and uh, continue to apply it on a daily basis so God wants to talk to you daily. Jeremiah 25, verse 4, the Bible says, And the Lord sent to you all his servants, the prophet, rising early and sending them. So, daily, and especially early in the morning, God sent his prophet to them every single day. And in Jeremiah chapter 44, verse 4, Jeremiah chapter 44, verse 4, the Bible says, However, I have sent to you all my servants, the prophet, rising early and sending them, saying, Do not do uh, these abominable things uh, that I hate. So God wants to speak to us on a daily basis. The reason why you need to set the quality time early in the morning. It's because uh, do you have less distraction in the morning? 
and uh, God wants to get your attention. God wants to be the first one to talk to you before you can talk to anyone else. Make it as um, your own uh, routine that you want to talk to God first before you talk to anyone else. Talk to him first of all. So that's what God did for Israel. Early in the morning, every single day, he sent them his, ser his servant, the prophet, so that uh, they can go and talk to them, saying to them, this is what the Lord said, this is what the Lord wants you to do, and so on and so forth. Now, in the one way look at the book of Genesis, chapter 3, from verse 8 to verse 11, God used to come and see uh, Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. He will come, he wants to fellowship with them, because God wants to converse with us. The Bible says, and they heard, so Adam and Eve, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. In the cool of the day, God was walking in the garden looking for Adam. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said, where are you? So he said, I've heard the voice, uh, your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So in the cool of the day, God came looking for Adam. Even when we have sinned, we've missed the mark. Don't run away from God. The plan of the enemy, like I explained the last time, is to cause us to sin so that our conscience will be accusing us and our heart will be condemning us and we will not want to pray because we know so many things against ourselves. The Bible says... Uh, um, How do you call it? We will know so many things about ourselves. We will not have confidence to come boldly before the throne of God. But God is the one that is going after Adam because he wants to restore the relationship. God is always into the business of restoring a fellowship, restoring a relationship with himself and with one another. We, believers, we have received the ministry of reconciliation and we preach the word of reconciliation. We reconcile mankind to God when we lead them to salvation. And we also reconcile mankind between uh, them, uh, with one another. We have the word of reconciliation and the ministry of reconciliation. So don't run away from God, even when you've missed the mark, Run to God. Now, seek God early in the morning. That's your priority. Rearrange your day. If uh, rearrange your day so that you'll be able to seek him early in the morning. The ideal case is that you will seek him in the morning and you will seek him in the evening. The first thing that you do is to talk to God uh, having a tete-a-tete -tete with God, face-to-face uh, -face, uh, uh, dialogue with God, an intimate moment uh, with God in the morning and the evening. The first thing that you do and the last thing that you do. In the Bible study of uh, the seven Hebrew words for praise, well, we explained that they were offering a burnt uh, uh, offering early in the morning before they start the day for the whole nation and they would uh, raise the, um, the breast of that um, animal uh, which is the seat of wisdom and they will say Lord arise and let all of our enemies be scattered so as we go into our field working today we want you to go before us and uh, conquer our enemies give us the victory subdue them so Lord arise as we are going out. And when they came back uh, in the evening, they had uh, the shoulder uh, that they lifted as a wave offering uh, that Father, we thank you, hallelujah, for giving us journey mercies. You kept us and our, 
our going out and our coming in. So we want to thank you for all that you have done during the day. It was the first thing that they did before going out and the last thing that they did before the head hitting the, the pillow. So we need to go back into practical Christianity, having a, a time with uh, God. So seek God early in the morning. The Bible tells us in the book of Psalm 63, verse 1, Psalm 63, verse 1, O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek, uh, seek you. My soul thirsts for you, and my flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So early in the morning, he seeks uh, the face of the Lord. The reason why God speaks a lot early in the morning is because he can have our attention. And if you start uh, creating time for God early in the morning, you will see how God is going to speak to you more and more in the name of Jesus. If you start creating time for God before you go to bed as well, you see God also now coming in the night or even working early in the morning and starting the conversation with you in the name of Jesus. You need to be on talking terms with God. It's just like you. If you have a friend that uh, calls you, checks on you every week, you'll be expecting him to call call you the following week. You know it checks on when it is uh, uh, already Thursday, you should be expecting in his phone call. You just call to check on how you are doing. And if you see, for instance, already Saturday has come, he has not called, you also, you initiate the call and you call him and say, oh, or call her, just say, hi, I'm, how are you doing? And so on. I did not hear from you this week. Because you are on talking terms, it is unusual for him not to call you for a whole week. The same thing as well. When you become on talking terms with God, it will be unusual for God not to talk to you that day. He may not give you deep, deep revelation every day, but he would guide you in your daily decisions every single day. So initiate the conversation. Uh, he, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, he that wants to have friends must himself be friendly. The same thing as well. If you want to know God, you need to befriend him. You need to initiate the conversation. And the more you talk to him, the more God talks back to you. The more God wants to hang out with you. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 9 tells us, with my soul, I have desired you in, in the night. So it is not just in the day that he desired the Lord, now even in the night. So yes, by my spirit within me, I will seek you early. So he sought the Lord in the night, he desired the Lord in the night, and he desired the Lord also early in the morning. So we need to create a time for God. It is very, very important. God wants to talk to you. Point number two. Have a quiet time with God for at least an hour. I say again. Have a quiet time with God for at least an hour an hour. There is a teaching that is, uh, where God bless our brethren, that is coming uh, from um, the Babylon of this 21st century America. Babylon is a spirit thing. It's not a physical thing. Egypt is a spiritual thing. It is not a physical thing. When you read the book of uh, uh, Revelation, it tells you that it is a spiritual one. It is a spiritual thing. It even says that uh, uh, Babylon where our Christ was crucified and Egypt where our Christ was born. But we know that physically Christ was not crucified in Babylon. 
And we know that uh, physically as well, Christ was not born in Egypt. So Egypt and uh, Babylon, they are spiritual systems. So they vary. So if one, one country espouses uh, the values and uh, uh, that Babylonian system basically starts operating in that uh, country, in that nation among those people. So when the Bible is talking about get out of her, uh, Babylon is not talking about Iraq anymore. It is a spiritual system. So uh, the same thing as well uh, in the book of Revelation as well, you have uh, the Nicolaitan. Nicolaitan uh, was a deacon, Nicholas was a deacon in uh, the book of, uh, in uh, Rome and he usurped the authority, uh, neglected the apostles and uh, spread his uh, cancerous doctrine. And because Rome was the capital of the world, of the Roman Empire had the most in, more influence. So everybody espoused the teaching that was coming from uh, Rome, just like everybody also espouses the teaching that is coming from America. So in this 21st century, one just would talk about uh, the Nicolaitans. He's not, he's not going to talk about Rome. He's going to talk about uh, America. When he's talking about the Babylon, is going to talk about not just America, but also other countries that have basically embraced the Babylonian kind of a lifestyle and belief system. So when we read the Bible, we need to understand that these are spiritual systems. They are not fixed nations. So that teaching says that you can just pray as you go, pray in the shower, pray when you, as you are driving. Of course, we need to pray. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. That's what it means. So in every situation we find ourselves uh, to be in, we pray. Uh, when I'm driving towards a place, I pray. I sing in my car. I pray in tongues in my car. That's me praying without ceasing. When I'm under my shower, I like singing. Uh, leave the Bible says it lifts up holy hands everywhere. That's what, uh, what Paul tells uh, the church of uh, Thessalonica. So we lift up holy hands everywhere. We pray without uh, ceasing. So we are we practice the presence of the Lord. In that respect, uh, it is okay. Uh, we practice the so if you are in, in the car, pray. If you are uh, in the bakery, pray. If you are in the supermarket, pray. Uh, many times I go to the supermarket or I go to uh, shopping mall and God starts speaking to me what he wants me to buy and uh, as a gift for someone and so on and so forth. God wants to go with you as you go shopping as well. Uh, so do that kind of prayer. But you need to have a tete-a-tete -tete with God. You need to have a face-to-face -face time with God. You are married to God. You can, if you are married to someone, you and your spouse, you cannot have intimacy, koinonia, that in Greek, that intimacy. You cannot have koinonia or intimacy. When the Bible says, the, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship. That's a koinonia. It is like intercourse. You don't have intercourse or intimate rapport in uh, the shopping mall. You don't have, uh, you don't share secrets heart to heart in uh, the shopping mall. You spend, you do that in the secret. Uh, Place. That's why Jesus said, when you pray, go into your room and lock the door behind you. And your father sees in secret because he's looking for intimacy. That sees in secret will reward you openly. What you see outside is actually the result of the time that the, the intimacy see the intimacy that the person spent with uh, God. So God is calling us into the chamber to have an intimate conversation with us. So pray as you are driving, as you are shopping, uh, 
practice the presence of God. Everything that you want to do, you involve God. God, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do, and so on and so forth. And but what when we are talking about that one hour that God is requiring of us to spend with Him, a, a, a personal time or intimacy with Him. That does not include uh, you praying while you are driving and so on and so forth. You are never going to be uh, able to become strong as a believer if you don't spend time with them in the secret place. On average, in 2010, they did a survey in America. The average pastor only uh, spends a quiet time of uh, 15 minutes in America. So be it the Pentecost, all denominations uh, put together, they spend on average 15 minutes in prayer every day. That's the pastor. So if the pastors only spend 15 minutes, how will uh, the congregation be praying? It means that the congregation did not even pray at all. Or the, the only time they pray is when someone prays over them on Sunday. Which explains a lot of uh, carnality, a lot of uh, divorce in America, even among pastors, even among pastors in America, it is a 50% of uh, divorce. So the church is weak because uh, we are not spending time uh, in the closet with God. When you look at, uh, and that's why also you see pastors falling into sexual sins, you see uh, a lot, but the generation of uh, those of Azusa, the generation of Raina Banka, you have uh, Tia Lossborn, you never see them falling into sexual sin or financial manipulation. Why? Not because they were immune from those things. No, they, like the Bible says uh, in uh, Jer uh, James chapter 5, verse 17, that Elijah was a man that has the same nature that you and I have. He has the same nature. He was subject to the same uh, emotions and the same temptation. So what was the difference with uh, those people and uh, we in the 21st century? One, they practice righteousness. If you are practicing the righteousness, your conscience will not be accusing you. Your heart will not be condemning you. So you are going to be able to come boldly in the place uh, of uh, prayer uh, before the throne of God. The Christian that is practicing sin does not pray. And the praying the Christian does not sin. That's how simple it is. So the practice righteousness and the fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. Avails much. They were taught to pray through. What they have explained that in the best that you have a prayer, they were taught to pray through. To, what did they mean by praying through? They were inspired uh, by uh, Matthew chapter 26, where Jesus prayed for three hours, one hour, one hour, one hour for the same subject because he was about to go to the cross. Like I was explaining to someone uh, last week or this week, early this week, meekness, which uh, some Bible translation says it is a humility, it is not a humility. Meekness is a power under control. Meekness, again, a horse, a horse is meek when it has been tamed. All its, uh, its power is now... Uh, controlled with the beats and uh, in, in the mouth. When you capture a wild mustang, it is so powerful that it will not allow any human to sit on its back. So you need to have time to break that uh, the wheel of that, um, of that uh, horse. And uh, so that the horse, because if you jump on that horse, he will uh, kick you off that its back and he would, it would kick you with its uh, hooves and then even break your, your rib cage and you die. He has that power. So Mustang has a tremendous power to throw you off its back and trample you with its hooves and you die literally. So a horse is now meek 
when the human has been able to tame that uh, horse that now is allowing you to sit and you are riding smoothly you are turning only with uh, uh, the, you, that um, the the ropes that you put around its uh, its mouth uh, with the br bridle so you are turning left it's turning left you are turning right it's turn you don't even need to, to whip it anymore gently it's just going it's power under control and only in the place of a prayer that God can break us. In the place of intimacy that God can break us. We would have personal victory so that we are not going to act in the flesh. And the reason why Jesus was praying because he had all the power. He was God in the flesh. When he cursed the fig tree, the fig tree dried up from the root. He walked on water. He multiplied uh, bread. So, like you say to Pilate, you have no power over me except what has been given unto you. If I want it to be free from uh, this uh, ar arrest, I could even ask my father and he will send me 12 legion of angels. One legion is, uh, one full legion is uh, 6,000. Uh, uh, soldiers. So 12 legion is 72,000 soldiers. And in the book of Isaiah chapter 38, Isaiah chapter 38, God only sent one angel in the camp of uh, the Assyrian and that angel killed one, uh, killed um, 85,000 Assyrians. So when Sinekarib and Rabsheke woke up in the morning, the whole army was decimated. So with those 12 legions, so they have the capacity of uh, killing overnight 13 billion, 320 million foot soldiers. There is not a human army that can withstand uh, Jesus. So nobody took his life away from him. Like he said, no one takes away my life from me. If I don't want to die for the people, nobody can cause me to die. In fact, when they came to arrest him, he walked towards them. And Judah was leading that company of people that came to arrest him. Who? He said, who are you seeking? So whom are you seeking among all of us here? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, it is I. And they fell to the floor, just like when the Ark of the Covenant in the book of uh, First Samuel was brought in uh, the temple of Dagon and Dagon, the statue, the statue of Dagon fell the face to the floor, prostrated before the Ark of the Covenant. So that's what happened to them. One said, it is I. They all fell to the floor. They could not arrest him. The glory was around him that they could not even come close to him. And he said, and they stood up, they say, whom do you seek? They say, Jesus, I told you I am he. They all again fell. And then he allowed them to arrest him. They could not do anything. So that's why he was praying for those three hours. He says, if it is possible, is there no any other way for me to save those people without me dying for them? The father said, no, there's no other way. Many times we're not willing to do things. Many times uh, we are not willing to change. We want the other person to change first. Many times we are not willing even to serve the Lord. I was not willing to serve the Lord. I was not. If I tell you I was, I will be lying. But it is in the place of prayer that God breaks us. And he makes us willing to be willing. Not our will anymore. Like Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. So that when he came out of that secret place, he had personal victory. So spending time with God, what they used to call in the days of Azusa and the generation of Rainer Banke to pray through, they prayed until they had personal victory over the flesh. So that when they came out, when Jesus came out, when they slapped him on the face, 
he did not curse them to dry up and dead and drop dead. When uh, they plucked his beard, he did not uh, do anything to them. When they reviled him, the Bible says he did not revile them back. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. He had all the power to, to turn them into pillars of, of, of salt, <laughs> to cause them to, to call fire on them, like when John and uh, James, the sons of thunder, were saying uh, to Jesus, uh, don't you want to call fire on the Samaritan like Elijah called the fire on them and consumed them? Because they were hurt in the pride that they were not received and given uh, accommodation in that Samaritan city. Jesus said, you do not know which spirit you are. Meekness is a power under control. Moses was the meekest person on the face of the earth because he had tremendous power, yet he did not use it when the people were driving him so mad. So spending time with the Lord will first of all, deal with you and Jerry so that I will not react in the flesh, so that I will have personal victory over my day. So whatsoever now is going to be thrown at me out there, I'm not going to react according to my flesh because I already had a victory over my flesh in the secret place. But I'm going to act based on the word of God. Christian that react are Christians that uh, have not spent time with the Lord. Because if you spend time with the Lord, he will teach you how to act. And what it does not really matter what will happen during the day. You already know what are your marching orders, how you are supposed to behave. I used to react a lot. And now until God started to call me in the secret place, said, you are reacting to things because you did not spend time with me. But if you spend time with me, I'll even tell you ahead of time how to behave. I will teach you my ways. So Jesus tells us in that Matthew chapter 26, verse 40 to verse 41, he says to us, so I will read from verse 39. So he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, oh, my father, if it is possible. So even Jesus in the flesh did not want to go to the cross. Nobody wants to be crucified. Dying to self is very, very difficult. Let this cope pass from me. But nevertheless, nevertheless, not my will, not as I will, but your will be done. And verse 4, so he came to his disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said to them, Peter, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray. And verse 41, lest you fall into temptation. I know that the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. If Peter had prayed instead of sleeping, he would have never denied Jesus. I say again, and Jesus is trying to explain to you why he wants him to pray. The enemy wants us to be emotional. Luke 22, Luke explains it. Luke says it was because Jesus told them that he's now going to, to Jerusalem, he's going to be crucified, and the sorrow filled them. So because they were sorrowful, they said, what's the point of praying again? He's going to die. What would become of us, of our movement? So they were sorrowful. That's why even when they told them to pray, they did not want to pray. Regardless of what you are going through, man always ought to pray. Luke chapter 18. We always ought to pray. We were designed to pray. That's the only way we survive. We ought to pray. And if we pray, if we spend time with God, we are not going to fall into temptation. The temptation will be there, but we are not going to fall into them because we've been empowered in the secret place. 
when we became born again in those days, in the, my, my, my parents and our family, the pastor introduced that we need to pray in the morning, in the evening. I did not know. Thank God for my pastor. Thank God in those days, we believed that the pastor heard from the Lord. We believed that the pastor heard from the Lord. He did not explain everything, but we believed that he heard from the Lord. Then whatever he told us to do, we followed. Then we just saw effortless uh, transformation in our life, uh, in the marriage of our parents. It was restored and everything. But now that I have uh, come, God has now explained why he asks us to do things. Because one of the things that I hated is that people could not explain why. And I always like to ask questions, why, 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 why? Some teachers, even when I was in school, used to be uh, upset with me because I would always ask why. The fact is that they did not know the answer. That's why they were upset with me. But when you know the answer, why is God asking us to do that? then you don't need to be upset. Just explain to people the reason why God wants us to do that. The devil, Jesus said to, to, to Peter, listen, Peter, I've seen Satan. Satan wants to sift you as wheat. To sift, um, back then, even in some places in Africa, in Asia, when they have, for instance, uh, wheat, and they have um, uh, rice or millet, there is a chaff around that rice. So when they would harvest the rice or the wheat or the millet, they will uh, put it, uh, they would gather it and they will take a stick, a big stick, and they would pound that rice. They would pound that millet to separate the grain from uh, the chaff. And after that, they will put it in a basket that is a bit flat, like uh, it's kind of like that, not too flat, but it has a, has a little curvature. And uh, they would shake it this way so that uh, the, the grain would go underneath and the chaff would come uh, on, the, on top and they would toss the thing in the air so that as it is tossed in the air, the wind would blow the chaff away and the grain would fall back into the basket and they would shake it again so that the grain would go down and they would toss it. So Jesus, when Jesus said, you need to, when you read the Bible, you need to have a mental picture of what Jesus is saying. If God speaks in pictures, a picture is worth 10,000 words. So God always speaks in pictures so that you would understand actually what the devil wants to do. So Jesus is saying to Peter, this is what the enemy has devised against you. He wants to beat you mercilessly, turn your life upside and down. Everything is a mess. You don't even know your head from your feet. But this is his plan. But if you pray, I'm not saying that he's not going to buffet you. Like Paul said, Satan assigned a messenger a demon 24-7 against Paul to buffet Paul all the time. But God said to Paul, don't worry, my grace is sufficient. And uh, you are going to overcome it. And shortly, the God of peace, Romans chapter 16, verse 20, will crush Satan under your feet. So don't worry about Satan buffeting you. He has assigned a demon to buffet you 24-7. Because my grace is made perfect in your weakness. So we know we are weak. But when I come in the place of prayer, oh, God takes away my weakness. He gives me strength. People do not understand how am I continuing this journey? How am I not discouraged? Because I'm being energized in my closet as I spend time with God. So if Peter had prayed, the story would have been different. He would not have denied the Lord three times. So pray. Satan wants to sift you as wheat. And he was sleeping. Can't you at least tarry with me for an hour? And he came three times. Peter was still sleeping. <sighs> okay. But Jesus said, it is enough. Okay. 
I've prayed for you. You are still going to deny me because you did not pray. There are things that if we don't do, Jesus even cannot do that for us. We need to partner with Jesus. We are co-laborers. He's living forever to make intercession for us at the right hand of the Father, but we have our place. We also need to stand in the place of prayer. Because Peter did not stand in the place of prayer, so Jesus went to the next prayer point. Okay. Because he has not prayed, he's still going to deny Jesus. But I don't want him to so deny me and that he will not even come back to the faith. So please, Jesus now went to the second level of intercession. God, I know he's going to forsake me. He's going to abandon me. All of them, are, in fact, if they pray, they would not have forsaken Jesus, all of them, but they were sleeping. So the plan of the enemy is to play with your emotions, that you are sorrowful, you are angry, and all those emotions that would push you not to pray. Today, I don't feel like praying. I'm angry. Today, I'm upset. Today, I'm, so, I'm sorrowful. We are not ignorant of the devices of the enemy. He will be hit you hard so that you will stop praying. His purpose is for you to stop praying. If you do not understand what is going on because your prayers are are disturbing him. He would change the laws of the country just to stop one person from praying, uh, Daniel, because his consistency in prayer, he was praying five times a day. And they made a law that no one would pray for a whole month. Daniel understood. Because as he was praying, what was happening in the spirit is that angels were being uh, released to go and fight uh, the demon over Persia, so that the people can be set free. The prayer of one man delivered the whole nation. So the enemy wanted to stop his uh, prayer. Daniel said, I understand. The people who know the Lord of God, they don't know about him. Then the word there is the, as a man knows his wife, like uh, the Bible, the Bible says, Adam knew Eve, has intimacy, intercourse with God. The people who know Daniel chapter 11, verse 32 and 33, the people who know the Lord of God, they shall be strong and they will carry out a mighty exploit. And those of them that have understanding, what will they do? They will instruct other people to do the same thing because we understand what is happening in the spirit realm. So Jesus said, can't you at least tarry with me for an hour? In Mark chapter 13, verse uh, 30, uh, 5 to 37, Mark chapter 13, verse 35 to 37, Jesus is saying to us, he says to us, watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, Lest coming suddenly, he may find you sleeping. Verse 37, that's really where we are going. What I say to one, I say to all, watch. So he did not just say it to them. He says that to all of us. I used to sing, these are the days of Elijah. <laughs> and I used to be very angry. And I used to weep. And God said to me, well, the same thing he said to Cain, why is your countenance down? Why do you envy Elijah? Why do you envy Paul? Why do you envy any of the characters in the Bible? If you do what is right, if you do what they did, will I not also accept you? We don't want uh, to leave uh, the way they lived, but we want the, the same mirror because it is not going to happen. There is a minimum. We are going to spend eternity with God. Eternity. 
in heaven. If we cannot spend at least an hour with him here on earth, then how will we spend eternity with him? In heaven, we are going to be worshiping him. And in heaven, there is no prayer for marriage. There is no marriage in heaven. Spoiler alert, no marriage in heaven. In heaven, we are like angels. So we don't give our daughters into marriage. We don't take daughters for our son for marriage either. In heaven, there is no need for prosperity. Even the streets of heaven are paved with a pure gold. The gates are pearls. The foundation, 12 foundation are precious stones. What you are killing people for here on earth is a pavement in heaven. So what do we do? We worship the Lord. We say how much we love him and so on and so forth. So if we cannot spend some quality time face to face with him here on the side of the curtain, how will we spend eternity with uh, him. So what he says to one, he's saying to all of us that we need to watch and pray. Now, I've already mentioned that in Luke chapter 22, from verse 45 to verse 46, uh, Jesus, so when Jesus arose from prayer, came to his disciples, found them sleeping from sorrow. So it was because they were sorrowful that they felt like, what's the point of praying anymore? That's when you are vulnerable. Then he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray, lest you enter or fall into temptation. Now, in the place of prayer, something happens. You may not know it, but this always happens in the place of prayer. When, you are, when I talk about prayer, it is not just prayer. Prayer involves reading the word, of praising the Lord, everything that we do when we come on Sunday or today. We use us, we praise the Lord, we do the free peace. We praise, we pray, and we preach or read the word of God or meditate on the word of God. We are going to go through it. So we always do those three things. So that's also what you need to be doing in your secret place. Let everything, the Bible says, let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. If you are braving, then praise the Lord. You must praise him because, not because uh, uh, you are doing him a favor, but because he's worthy of your praise, worthy of uh, your, 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 your honor and uh, of your acclamation. He needs you to praise him because he's the one who redeemed you from. Uh, the power of darkness and translated you now into the kingdom of the son of his love. So you need to praise him. That's why we have this hymn book. You don't need to be an opera singer. God knows your vocal cord. He knows how sweet your voice is. So sing, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. It doesn't need to be a melodious uh, noise, just a joyful one unto the Lord. Force yourself. Don't go by what, what you feel. You are going to fall all the time for what the devil is doing. I told you last year when I was uh, praying and uh, fasting, I think it was November, not November last year, so November 2020, I think, yeah, 2020, I was praying and fasting and the Lord told us to praise him. So we were praying, the church was praising for one week but I was fasting for, for, uh, for yeah, a long time. Uh, that, that's all I would say. And as I was fasting and praying, that's when uh, my pastor died. And that day was, the, I think, a Thursday or some, that, something like that. We were doing the praise. You saw me. I was praying. Even people thought that I was overjoyed. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, that the, in the year that the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And the train of his glory filled the temple. And I saw the cherubim, and they were all singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The, old, the whole earth is filled with his uh, glory. I understood what the enemy was trying to do. He was trying to give me a big punch in the gut so that I will say, What's the point? 
of even fasting and praying. You could not even protect uh, my, uh, my pastor. Don't you care about him? He has served you. But the Bible already told us that, that uh, some of us are going to be poisoned, and he was poisoned. Matthew 23 already told me what will happen. Some of you, they are going to kill you. His plan was for Jerry to get out of the, get down that mountain. For Jerry to stop praying because he was a sorrowful. Was I sorrowful? Yes. But I prayed. I prayed. My, as I was fasting this year, my cousin died. And I was weeping. I even uh, took two to three days off work. Because I love my, my little cousin, 24. She died like a chicken of her own foolishness. Well, so the plan of the enemy, he said not to whisper. Why do you even want to, to continue to fast? Just go eat. <laughs> I looked at the devil. I say, get behind me, Satan. I know exactly all your tricks. Because I've read it in the Bible. I know exactly what you're after. Because... Uh, you want me to get down that mountain because you don't want the millions to be saved. You don't want me, I'm seeing the millions. And you are trying to distract me with uh, the, those what is happening left and right. I am focused in the mighty name of uh, Jesus. So we should not be ignorant of the strategies, the devices, the schemes of the devil. Watch and pray. So when we are praying, God is taking away our weaknesses. When we are spending time in his word, he's taking away our weaknesses and giving us his spiritual strength. In the book of Isaiah chapter 40 from verse 28 to verse 31. Isaiah chapter 40 from verse 28 to verse 31. The Bible says, have you not known? He's asking us a question. Because many of us do not know it. Have you not heard? Because many of us have not received that kind of teaching that you are, that is actually basic in Christianity. The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of uh, the ends of the earth. He neither faints, hallelujah, uh, nor is weary. And I told you last time, the book of Proverbs says, if you faint in the days of adversary, of our adversity, sorry, it simply means that your strength is small. I used to faint all the time. Whatever the enemy would do to me, I would stop praying. Whatever you do to me, I would stop reading my Bible. I don't feel like reading today. I don't feel like it simply reveals how weak I was. If I faint because of the adversary, uh, my faith is uh, weak. I'm spiritually a weak person. But the everlasting God, he neither faints nor is weary. Now, the Bible says in the book of Galatians chapter 6, uh, don't get weary in doing the good because in due season you are going to reap if you do not uh, faint. Galatians chapter 6. So many times we've been doing good to people, doing good to people. We've been forgiving those same people again and again. Ah, why will I continue to forgive that person? I'm weary of doing that. I want to give up. That's it. But when you come in the place of prayer, God gives you strength again to continue to forgive them, to continue to love them, to continue to not give up on them. Love never fails. But it is impossible, according to a human, to not be weary, to not faint. But as you spend time with the one who is in love, God does not have love. He is love. The first banner that he sets over us is the banner of love, as we saw on Saturday. So he's the one that knows the unfailing love. Sexual love, eros will fail. Physical attraction will fail. Though we need it, but it will fail. Friendship will fail. Filios will fail. He asked in John chapter 21, he asked Peter, do you love me uh, unconditionally? 
Peter said, I love you as a friend. If you told me love me as a friend, you would not have denied me when I was in trouble. Friends sticks closer than a brother. When I was in trouble, you denied me. So I even question your friendship. So friendship also will fail. People would fail you. You thought they were your friends, they would betray you. Offense is bound to happen. But when you come in the secret place, you wait upon the Lord. This, you are worshiping him in the morning. You are the first to praise him. And then you are uh, praying. And then you are reading his word. He's going to speak to you. He's going to minister unto you. And then he's going to take your weariness away. He's going to take uh, uh, your fainting away. And you stand strong again able to forgive those people, able to love those people. When you see a man of God slapping someone for deliverance, <laughs> it means that his time in the secret place is now just decaying. If you see a man of God falling into sexual sin, he did not fall just overnight. His secret place uh, was no more active. All his prayers were only in public with other people, in church, uh, in the prayer groups. All that we need to do, but you need a tete-a-tete, -a, -tete, a face to face dialogue in your closet with the Lord. And the more God takes you higher, the more you spend time uh, with God. But what he requires of all believers is at least to tarry with him for an hour. That's for everyone. What I say to one, I say to all. Don't believe. Uh, those that will say to you, no, that's legalism. There is a burden in Christianity and there is a yoke. Because that burden is light, yes. That yoke is easy because we want to learn from Jesus. That's what he said to us. So there's a yoke in Christianity and there's a burden. If we want to be more like a Christ, we will need to do what he requires of us. And effortlessly, we are going to change. Those that uh, say otherwise, like Paul says to Timothy, <laughs> uh, they are just ignorant. And if you look at the life, they are very proud of you. They are very carnal. It means that they don't have a secret place. Because God cannot talk to them. So, his understanding is unsearchable. So all the things that she was struggling with, how will I do this? God has an, an understanding that is unsearchable. There is a depth that he, a revelation that he has that can solve your problem. But why don't you come? You tell someone secrets as you are in the shopping mall. No. You don't want other people to hear those secrets. If it is a secret, then it is behind closed doors. It is a closed meeting. Not everybody is allowed in that meeting. So if you want God to speak more to you, you need to hide in the secret place. So he gives a power to the weak. So as you are spending time, he's giving you power. I want to give up. I want to give up. I cannot do this anymore. Many times, <laughs> I pray God. In fact, I was looking for God. Oh, God, have mercy. I will never finish this thing. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Many times in those days, I will I say, God, I don't see you. I don't see you. But just to let you know, I'm writing my resignation letter. So I sat down, I write a five letter. Five page, uh, five pages registration letter uh, that uh, I am resigning from the ministry. <laughs> so I write, write all the reasons I want to resign. And then I put in an envelope. I say, God, tell me what, where is your postcode? Where is your postcode? And then I know exactly that I'm just acting like a fool. But sometimes I used to have ten from. It's a relationship that you have with God. Sometimes you you kick the cat. Uh, so, but the Bible says in the Book of Lamentation, when we act like fools, God just put His fingers 
in his ears so that he will not listen to our foolishness. Because if you listen to all the foolishness that is coming out of our mouth, when especially we are baby in Christ, then everything is going to life and death are in the power of the tongue. So if God listens to everything that we are saying when we are a uh, baby in Christ, then it will uh, uh, be curses in our own life. So you, the Bible says in the book of Lamentation, he puts his fingers in his ear so that he will not listen to foolishness that is coming out of uh, our mouth. So when I say, uh, one of the, my best scriptures in the book of Proverbs, that foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. And I totally know, I, Sherry, I'm a fool. I'm a fool. Many times I just sit and say, God, thank you for having patience with me. Because when I look back, how I used to be a fool, but you were patient with me. So I would write my five pages of resurrection, resurrection letter, and I would come out. But the good thing is I would continue to pray. Even if I'm angry, I would continue to pray. Because I understood something. It did not matter how I felt. I have a command. I always ought to pray. I will, even if I did not understand what was happening in the spirit, you need, just like with the parents, God is our father. Many times our children did not understand why we asked them to do things. But because we are under, they are under our authority, they are supposed to obey, even if they don't like it or they don't feel like it. The book of Hebrews chapter 12 says that we had earthly parents who disciplined us, who corrected us according to what seemed right to them. And we were subject to them. We reverenced them. So should we not also be in subjection to the father of heaven who actually is correcting us and disciplining us so that we can become partakers or sharers of his uh, godliness or holiness. And discipline is not pleasant at first, but later on it is going to yield the desired fruit. If I would see the transformation in your life, in your marriage, in your health, and so on and so forth. But you need to trust in even one you do not understand. So I will continue to pray. Luke chapter 18, man always uh, ought to pray. And I will go out, I will be praying in tongues uh, and with my letter of resignation. And I've walked sometimes for six hours, praying in tongues for six hours. And then I will see the red box, uh, the mail, royal mail, uh, royal mail, uh, red box. And I will, uh, I will put to Jesus and I'll put the stamp <laughs> and I'll throw it inside. I think one of the postmen was seeing those letters. He thought someone, this guy is crazy, he has lost his mind. And I will go home, I will weep, and I will sleep. And, but the next day, something would happen. I would just be strong. <laughs> because God, as I did my part, God took my weakness, he gave strength to the weak. So, that's what God does in, the, in our secret place. But we do our part, even when we don't feel like it, we do our part. And, say, and those who have no might increases uh, strength. When you have no might at all, you will increase your strength. It is not by might, the ability of one person, how clever you are how strong you are, how financially empowered you are. It is not by power. It is not by might, collective effort. So these are that's the meaning of those words in um, Zechariah and in here in also in Isaiah. So by might, the ability of many people. So you have uh, lots of people brainstorming about that the idea, how can we do it? You have a panel of uh, counselors, you put all your money together, might is a collective effort in this in this uh, in this uh, in this, uh, in this uh, verse. So you can even gather a hundred people and so on. And so it is not by might either, but by my spirit. So when you are numerically small, God would increase your strength. That one of you would just a thousand, and two of you would put ten thousand to flight. So. Though numerically you are outnumbered by the enemies, so you cannot uh, use might because you are a tiny group. 
but it will increase your strength, your spiritual strength. That one of you now chase a thousand. The book of Isaiah says that one will become like David. Hallelujah. And the weak will become like David. And the strong one will become like the whole house of uh, David. When we are outnumbered, God increases our strength. The same for the house of prayer for all nations. How many of us are in the house of prayer for all nations in America to be able to do what we are doing on the, at the national level? So that's why I wait upon the Lord because I know I'm at a disadvantage. So, so that God can increase our strength, though we are, we lack might, we lack the numerical number, the numerical power. So I know where to get the, the strength that God would multiply it, that two of us would, one of which is a thousand, and two of us would put even 10,000 to flight. And there are other promises in the book of Deuteronomy that is uh, even more than, uh, uh, even a, two of you would put 100,000 to flight. People only know one of you would chase a thousand, two of you put 10,000 to flight. There's another scripture in Deuteronomy. I will not tell you tonight. You will discover that Gideon can stand with 300 and face a million, and he would overcome them. Gideon could say to the, the, the 30,000, go home. I don't need your help. Go home. Who so fearful? Go home, 20,000 went home. Whosoever would not give the glory to God, go home. 9,700 left and only 300 stayed. With that, a small number. God increased the strength. And they overcame 1 million Midianite. So as you wait upon the Lord, you may be a tiny company, but God would cause you to have a contract that that's supposed to go to big companies like uh, Hewlett Packard or Microsoft. God would increase your strength. But it is done in the secret place. When you look at the, the contribution of the house of prayer, how much is there in that account? Nothing. But how can we pay for those TV programs? So we lack the might, but God increases the financial strength in the mighty name of Jesus. All that is done when you wait upon the Lord. So he says, even the youths, they shall paint and be weary. So it is not because they are young that they are doing that. Listen, even youths, they paint. They also get discouraged. They also uh, become weary of doing good, of doing the right thing. And the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait upon the Lord in the secret place every day, those who wait upon the Lord, that, that when you have that day, personal devotion with the, Lord, with the Lord every day, make it part of your routine. Effortlessly, things are going to change. Those who wait upon the Lord, they shall renew the strength. Hallelujah. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. And the eagle would pluck its old feathers and hide in that cave and new feathers will grow all over his body again. He's a renewed God will renew your strength like that of the eagle. You renew your health. You shall mount up. You would soar above. The eagle does not flap its wings all the time like those tiny birds. The eagle glides. Hallelujah. The eagle does not fly at low attitude. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. There is a traffic and traffic jam on the floor. If you are going on the uh, M8 in Glasgow here, from Paisley to Glasgow at the 4 p.m., you see so much traffic jam on that M8, M77, M74, so much traffic uh, jam. When you are where everyone is, that's why you would have a traffic and people will slow you down. But if you're a helicopter, there's no traffic there. But the helicopter as well is not flying that high. Uh, if there is a strong wind, the helicopter is going to be grounded. But 
if you are in those days where they used to have the Concord, uh, but they stopped it. It uh, was a supersonic uh, commercial jet. The Concord would fly above the clouds like a uh, supersonic uh, MiG or jet fighter. So where there is a storm below the clouds, it does not feel it. So when you wait upon the Lord, you rise above the clouds, above the storm. When other people cannot fly because of the lack of visibility, you are on top, of the, you are flying high. And you see far, because an eagle can see one mile away uh, the, it's, it's dinner. You have a sharp vision as you wait upon the Lord. You become focused to accomplish what God has called you to do. Less distraction. We are stagnant because we are on the floor. But as you ascend, as you wait upon the Lord, you mount up with wings like eagles. The storms that are destroying other people's relationships, other people's marriages will not destroy you. The storms that are destroying your own children. Many of us, sometimes we are chasing after money so much that we don't have time to wait upon the Lord. We don't have time for the children. We don't have time for the spouse. That's why God commanded the Sabbath so we can wait upon him. When we were not Christian, my mom was working a lot. She, uh, because her job was demanding, that, which was true. But after we became a, a Christians, the pastor asked her to restructure her work. So whenever she finished, uh, she closed that in the office, she brought the work home. She brought all the files home. She worked at home with her as the children. So that at eight, we'll be able to pray as a family. 8 p.m. we'll be able to prepare the family. And then when we finish by 8 to 30, in the evening we only do half an hour because we need to study. Uh, we, we are still in primary school, secondary school and high school. We need to study. So at, we only pray for a half an hour in the, in the evening, but we will pray for one hour in the morning. And then she will continue to work, but she's at home with us. And then in the morning, they will wake up at 5 uh they will pray from five to three as a couple they'll pray from because they need us so they have the other problem you should not burden the children with all the problems that you have so they will pray for, for five to to five to thirty half an hour and then they will come to our bedroom because otherwise we will be making excuses i don't want to wake up mom i'm too tired no, they will come to our bedroom so you don't have any excuse that you cannot wake up to pray mm -hmm. so they will pray in our bedroom, in the bedroom of my brother, because my brother, they were the one that had the problem waking up. I never had the problem waking up. So they would go there because uh, they were always uh, sleeping. So we would do the prayer in the morning in that room from uh, 5.30 to 6.30, one hour. So we would praise the Lord. We would read the word of God. Uh, and then we will uh, pray. And then we start getting ready to go to work, getting ready to go to school. If you train up the child in the way of the Lord when he grows up, he's not going to depart from it. The reason why Genesis chapter 18, God appeared to Abraham, God said, the reason why I'm not hiding anything from Abraham, because he is going to command, not suggest, he's going to command his household after him to walk in the same step of righteousness. God has no interest revealing things to you if you are going to keep it to yourself. God is after you, your children, and your whole household, even after you. So that through you, through one person, you will create a whole nation. You do not understand what I'm saying. Through one nation, through one individual, Abraham, Abraham is going to model the family so that all the other family will copy basically the way Abraham is praying, the way Abraham is having a relationship with God, the way Abraham is training his children in the path of righteousness. So God took one person and made him a model, made his family a prototype and say imitate Abraham. So that's what God does. God wants to model your family so that uh, your children would copy you. Our children, they copy us. 
So that's why it is very important that we do our best to make things work. So we are pioneering, like we saw in the foundation of our Christian marriage, we are pioneering things. Many times, no one in our family was married. We always lived in uh, polygamy and so on and so forth. There was always divorce. So they've never seen a husband and a, and, uh, and a wife raising children together. They've never seen a family, even if it is a recomposed home, it is still a family. Joseph was not the father of, uh, of Jesus, yet God put Jesus under Joseph. And he was submitted, according to Luke chapter 2, to Moses, to, sorry, to, to Joseph. So if we don't pioneer things, our children will not have a reference frame to copy. They would give up altogether. They would faint in the, within them, saying that, oh, if it did not work for my grandmother, it did not work for my, 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 my mother, why will it work for me? The reason why even in, in this generation, Many women, they want to be married. Many women, they want to be married in this generation. But they've seen marriage not working in the parents. They are Christians. And when I talk to them is, oh, we just want to, to see how things are going to, uh, to, to work. So we don't just want to enter and then we come out. Because that's what they've seen. So they don't have a, a reference frame that it can work. So when I told them even, okay, but you are sinning against God, they say, ah, yeah. They are now afraid of marriage. They're now afraid of commitment because they've seen around them it has not worked. The faith that was in Lois became the faith of Eunice, and which was, so, sorry, Eunice, the grandmother, Lois, the mother, it became the faith of uh, Timothy the grandson. Our children, they literally follow what we are doing. So that's why we need to make things work, not just for our own sake, but for the sake of the next generation, that they would imitate us as we are imitating Jesus. Very, very important. So as we wait upon the Lord, God is going to be able to correct us and teach us wonderful things to do in the name of Jesus. Last point, meditate on the word of God in your quiet time. So as you are waiting upon the Lord, meditate on the word of God. That is the secret of victory. Don't just read the word of God, meditate on it. That was the secret that God gave to Joshua, the secret that God gave to David. It's also my secret. And the secret of any man of God, woman of God, that God mightly used, it is the meditation of the word of God. We Christians don't do uh, Eastern meditation. Christianity has been uh, plagued with uh, Hinduism. Well, we have those soaking uh, music. So you have an instrumentalist uh, music that is playing in the background and uh, you just sit there, you empty your head, that is Buddhism, we don't do that. Christian meditation, we don't empty our head. Christian meditation, we ponder the scripture. To meditate is to ruminate, just like uh, a cow or a sheep will eat grass, chew it, he will chew the cud, so it will go into his stomach and he will sit for a while, and then vomit it back into his mouth and chew again on it. It's a meditation is to ponder, to examine, to consider, to ruminate on something. Now, when the Bible, uh, uh, Joshua chapter 1, uh, verse uh, 7 to verse 9, the Bible says, God is saying to Joshua, okay, be strong and very courageous, okay, that you may observe to do. So there is a doing of the word of God that is required. That you may observe to do according to the, uh, all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. So if you, have, if you are a doer of the word of God, you are going to prosper. 
doesn't matter where you are going, you are going to prosper. Now, verse eight, this book of the law, this one, okay? This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Then that, uh, where am I? This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, you, but you shall meditate, you shall ponder, you shall ruminate, you shall consider. Meditate in it day and night, okay? Day and night. That you may observe to do. So the end of meditation is instruction. When you are meditating on the word of God, you are going to receive instruction from the Lord. Do this, do this to get out of your problem. Do this, do this to see the situation improve. Do this, do that. When we meditate on the word of God, we receive instruction. The end of meditation is receiving instruction. You will receive instruction what you ought to do. What is your part to play? Don't just meditate to come and preach. We studied, like I said, I did not write those my week to make to preach to anyone. It was my meditation, my time with the Lord. And it blessed one person, Sister Louise. And then it has been blessing many people. It was my secret place. It was never to preach to anyone. I was pondering on the word of God. So, meditate day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. Then you will see something will happen to you. Then, you, for then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. You will have good success as you meditate on the word of God. Psalm chapter 1, that also was the secret of David. Psalm chapter 1, the Bible says, blessed is from verse 1. There are only six verses. But blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. So when I, so when I, mean, what do I, I, will, I will give you an example of meditation. So when I'm reading my Bible, I'm not reading to score some point. I'll write four chapters a day. No. Do that if you want, but have time to meditate on the word of God. So when I read from the verse one, blessed is the man. I should have done it with Joshua, but let me do that with uh, chapter one. So to, to give an example of meditation, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, no stand, no stands in the path of sinners, no sits in the seat of scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, uh, and in his law, he meditates uh, day and night. So these are the two first verses. Now I read, okay, now, blessed is Jerry who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. And then I sit down and say, okay, Jerry, how many friends that you have that are ungodly, that are giving you wrong advices? You are going through uh, immigration. They just say to you, oh, if you just get married, you are going to be able to have uh, uh, papers. So I'm marrying for, not for love, but uh, with uh, evil uh, agenda. So my love is with hypocrisy. So that's an ungodly counsel. So even if that man is a pastor here in Glasgow, I put a cross. So, so I will not uh, walk in the, uh, the counsel of that ungodly person, though he's calling himself a pastor. Uh, do a fake marriage, pay 5,000 pounds, and then someone will accept to marry you and you'll be able to have the British citizenship very soon. That's an ungodly counsel. So I don't do that in the name of Jesus. I want to be like David. I did not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. No stand in the path of sinners. Jerry, how many of your friends are always in Calabash and always in nine clubs? And they profess to be a Christian. I say, no, no reveler will enter the kingdom of God. So I'm no longer going to be in the path of uh, the sinners. I'm going to walk according to the book of Isaiah chapter 50, uh, chapter 35, 38, verse 5, Isaiah 38, verse 5. I'm going to walk in the highway of, uh, highway of holiness. I don't want to walk in the path of the sinners anymore. I want to walk in the highway of holiness. When people are sinning, they know I stand for holiness, not to have paths of holiness. I don't want paths of holiness. I want uh, motorways of holiness. You can't confuse a motorway with a country, uh, countryside road. No. So I want to walk on the motorway of holiness. Everybody knows what I stand for. So I continue to read. Noah sits in the seats of scornful. 
the scornful, hmm, those who mock Christian values, those who are mockers, like Peter said, in the last days, mockers will come. Uh, and they will say, since the Lord Jesus died and rose again, he promised that he's going to come. Where is the promise of his coming? Days are co coming, days are going, years in and year out. He has not come back. You are wasting your time with Christianity, you're wasting up on the Lord. They are scornful. Why do you hold on to your integrity? Why don't you compromise like everybody? Like when Sister, uh, uh, Sister Harriet sent me a message, some uh, friend of hers was saying to her that she was wasting her time serving the Lord. Uh, that why where are the paper? And I send her text message. I say because they have said that that where is your God and where are your papers? I say that says the Lord. And you are going to get your papers in the name of Jesus. I've forgotten all the, that. It was somewhere in Isaiah that I, the Lord said that so I send it to her in the name of Jesus. So those that are mocking my God, I will not sit with them anymore. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to sit with people that are going to encourage my faith, encourage me to remain married, encourage me to, to walk in the path of righteousness, encourage me to continue to serve the Lord. That's, my, that's how I'm meditating. I'm using my head. That's Christian meditation. He says, but his delight is the, in the law of the Lord. Oh, I will continue to delight in this book. I will continue to be a doer of this book. And I will continue to meditate in day and night. I will meditate. God, speak to me. Speak to me today. Then what will happen to that man? David is telling us. Verse 3. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. So God, are you saying that if I do that, if I stop being with her, listening to the counsel of the God that are encouraging me to divorce, encouraging me to live in fornication, in adultery, in all kinds of sins, if I leave the path of the sinners, if I stop sitting with people that are ridiculing my Christian faith, making more prayer of my faith, are you saying that I'm going to be like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water? Are you saying that I'm going to bring the fruits, bring for fruits in, it, in my own season? I'm no longer going to be barren spiritually and physically. I'm going to be productive. I'm going to have good structures like jo Joshua said. God, I choose not to do your word. That is Christian meditation. His leaves shall also not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. God, you mean that not some of the things, whatever I do, be it immigration, be it marriage, be it finances, be it health, whatever I do is going to prosper? Yes. When I meditated on that psalm, I called all my friends, I cut them off. I deleted more than 300 people from my phone and I changed my phone number. Because many of my friends, the Congolese from Brazzaville, were scornful people. They will see the mocking people. I cut them off in Jesus' name. I only have one Congolese friend that is left from my Congo because he's not a scornful. Because my, there are some, in some countries, there are some spirits. The Cretans were liars. My people are scornful according to the flesh. So when I read it, I say, I'm no longer going to sit with you unless you become like uh, the book of Psalm 1. Say, if you stop being scornful, then I'm going to sit with you. But me, I want to be like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water. I want to bring my, my food in my own season. And whatever I do, I want it to prosper. God promised me that whatever I will do is going to prosper. No one can stop me except myself. But if I dissociate myself from the wrong counsel, the ungodly counsel, my marriage is going to work. My ministry is going to work. My career is going to work. That's how we meditate the word of God. And as you, so I'm receiving instruction. So I'm not, I'm not just reading it, but I'm receiving instruction. Based on that instruction, I stand up and I cut off the wrong relationship that I have. And I don't apologize at all. I don't. Because I know where I'm going. They don't know where they are going. I'm not going to turn around that same mountain and circle it for 40 years with them. 
No, I'm going places. I want to prosper in everything that I'm doing. And here, I need to cut off some ungodly counsel. I need to stop walking in the, in the paths of the sinners. I need to stop sitting with the scornful. I need now to delight. The Bible says if you delight yourself in the, the Lord your God, he's going to give you the desires of your heart. I said, okay, my delight is going to be in this book. I would want to do it. It may not be easy, but you say to Joshua, only be courageous. I know it is not easy, but only be courageous. At the end, you are going to have good success. And so shall it be. So spend time with the Lord. Switch off the music. And uh, the Bible says in uh, Psalm 46, verse 10, Psalm 46, verse 10, that uh, be still and know that I am uh, God. So be still and know that I am God. So be still in the presence of the Lord. Let him speak back to us. Many times when you are meditating, you will see now new thoughts are coming into your mind. The Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. So be still in the presence of the Lord and he wants to talk to you. Meditate on the word of God and pray. And that's why you write what you drew as lessons from that time of meditation. And then you stand up, God, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to forgive this person because you said I should be reconciled with that person. I'm going to, to call that person and so on and so forth in the mighty name of Jesus. So that's the hour. I will stop here because uh, otherwise I will never uh, finish. But that is your, your secret place. You know, not to share when we finish these teachings, like I was saying to one brother last week, today they are recorded. Sit down during the week, listen to them, and take notes again, what it ministered to you. All those foundations for Christian marriage, you read them and see how it applies to you, what you need to change. Don't worry about the other person. Focus about uh, focus on you. In the secret place, it is only you and God, not you and your husband. In the secret place, God sees you as an individual, not you and the church members or the church or the disciples. It is you. He wants a tete a tete with you, a one on one audience with you. So it is not, it is not when he's with you, there is not there to talk about other people, it's there to talk about you. He doesn't talk about Jerry. And he would instruct you, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1 and two, uh, 1 to 4. I will set myself on the tower and on the rampart, and I will watch to see what the Lord will say to me. And when he will, uh, I am corrected, I will make amends, I will change. So then the word of the Lord came again to me, say, write down the vision now. Right, you need to have a pen and a paper when you seek the face of the Lord write down the vision and make it plain that he may run. When you receive instruction now from the Lord, you, may, you receive correction, you may run. The vision is for an appointed time. And though it tarries, the Bible says we wait for it because at the end, it will speak for itself. So that is in a nutshell how we do a quiet time. And based on that, then we will be able to build on a prayer, on intercession. But you need... God wants to see you face to face, one on one. And then as a family, if you are a couple, you can do half an hour alone and then half an hour with your spouse. That's already the two of you because the two of you have become one flesh. But find time. If your children find the time, for those who are in leadership, that's another burden. Uh, but that that one hour of quiet time with the Lord, that's for every believer. What I say to one, I say to all. I want you to be stronger Christians. I want your marriages to last the test of time. I want your children to be saved. They are going to be saved because of your prayers. I want you to prosper in everything that you are doing. 
but uh, there is a formula. There is a precept upon precept and line upon line to do. Get rid of ungodly counsel in your life, Psalm 1. Get rid of, stop walking the path of uh, sinners. Stop uh, sitting with the scorn for those that are always insulting your faith, believing your faith, and believing and trying to kill your faith. Get rid of them. Find new friends that are godly that uh, have a spouse to your values, your, your new values that are encouraging you, not pulling you down in Jesus' name. I will just take one question. Is there a question? And then we will round up for tonight. Is there a question on what I've explained? A question. Going once, it's, it's not a question. It's, it's, it's a, it's just a wonderful thing that you said that all these years, it just makes sense to me today. It just fell into place because I've always wondered why Peter should deny Jesus. Anytime I read it, I cry. They said he wept bitterly, and I also cried. But today, he said, because he did not pray. He did not pray. And he fell into temptation. And that really touched me a lot. I said, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Any question? Going once, going <laughs> twice, <laughs> going the fries. Alison, any question? Oh. Uh, no, I, I think um, you've explained a lot really well, Pastor Jerry. I don't have any questions tonight. Okay, Jai. Thank you. Going once. Thank you, Jai. Once. Twice. <laughs> no, thanks, Jerry. It was great. It really oh, was. Just... Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, then. Let us pray. Father, we want to thank you. We want to give you all the glory. We want to give you all the praise. You are a good father. You want us to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you every day. The first thing when we wake up in the morning, the last thing we do when we go before we go to bed. Father, I pray that we would instill that routine in our life. It will become, we would practice your presence that you, you are with us 24 seven and you want truly to get closer to us. And I pray that you are not going to condemn anyone because you don't condemn anyone. We simply did not know, nobody ever told us and nobody ever taught us. But Father, we pray that from this day forward, you are going to rekindle the fire in our life, the hunger and the thirst for your word, spending time with you because you are the lover of our soul. We give you all the glory. Thank you for this evening. Thank you for this night and thank you for this week ahead of us. Let your name be glorified Amen. in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. I love you all and I will see you uh, Sunday. Sunday.